All right, good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to Politics and Prose at Union Market. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine, and uh, we're very excited uh, to be hosting uh, Lawrence Wright, uh, who's here, uh, of course, to discuss his uh, new novel, Mr. Texas. Um, now, uh, one challenge I have in uh, introducing Larry, uh, I think this is, uh, for me, it's the fifth time in, uh, in 10 years uh, or so that I've, I've had the honor, is that um, I'm, I'm running out of superlatives for him. Uh, he's written uh, some, some great books, uh, investigating, among other things, uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, Scientology, uh, Religion in America, and the Psychology of Twinship. Uh, his work, The Looming Tower, about the rise of Al-Qaeda and the intelligence failures that culminated in the 9-11 the attacks, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize for General Nonfiction in 2007. He's also made uh, distinguished contributions in other artistic fields, writing movie scripts, composing stage plays, and appearing in a couple of one-man shows uh, based on, on his journalism. There's really no end to where his artistry will take him. Uh, and that's in addition to his job as a staff writer at The uh, New Yorker, where he's worked for 31 years and where his pieces have won three uh, National Magazine Awards. Um, now, uh, of course, most of uh, Larry's uh, books uh, have been um, nonfiction, although he did publish a novel uh, 23 years ago, the darkly comic God's Favorite, uh, about the final days and power of um, uh, Panamanian strongman Manuel Noriega, uh, and a second one three years ago, uh, which I'm sure uh, many of you remember, the end of October, uh, that came out just as the COVID pandemic uh, was, uh, was starting and was pre presciently enough about a pandemic and uh, just happened to anticipate many of the events that uh, uh, were uh, unfolding then around the world. Uh, in Mr. Texas, Larry focuses his wit and literary skills on what's been his, his home state for a while now, uh, drawing on his deep knowledge uh, about and appreciation for many things Texan. Uh, he spins a yarn about a floundering small-time rancher turned state legislator uh, that's a rollicking satirical take on Lone Star politicking. Uh, but there's more than just laughs to this book. Uh, the characters are multidimensional, and the ethical and moral dilemmas uh, that they face are challenging. Uh, leading Paul Begala in the New York Times a review to call the book a character study cleverly hidden within a raucous, fast-paced, hilarious send-up. Uh, even the locals have applauded the novel, uh, said the Dallas Morning News. Larry has a perfect feel for Texas landscapes and characters for dialects and foibles. Uh, now, in conversation with Larry, uh, we have another treat, uh, journalist uh, Susan Glasser, a uh, veteran journalist uh, herself, uh, also with, uh, with The New Yorker, where she writes a weekly column on life in Washington. Susan has served previously as a top editor at Politico, Foreign Policy, and, and The Washington Post. Uh, and she and her husband, Peter Baker, have written uh, three uh, excellent books together, Kremlin Rising, about Putin's rise, uh, The Man Who Ran Washington, uh, about uh, former Secretary of State James Baker, and just last year, The Divider, about Trump's years uh, in the White House. So please join me in welcoming uh, Larry Wright and Susan Glasser. Thank you. They don't make these chairs easy, do they? No, they don't. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for coming tonight. I have to say, you're in for a treat. I can see many of you have already got the book, uh, so maybe you already know what I know, having uh, basically gobbled the book up in uh, close to a single sitting. This is a fantastic read. Uh, it's uh, awe-inspiring to have a colleague who somehow manages to write not only magazine articles, but plays and novels, and uh, oh, also, by the way, he's an amazing musician, and yes, also an incredibly wonderful guy. Um, so I'm super honored to be here with Larry tonight, and I'm sure like all of you, we just want to like 
throw a lot of questions at him because this book is a great novel, but it's also a great, I would say it's really a, you know, a portrait of power, how power works in Texas. Uh, you know, we can maybe do a little bit of compare and contrast yeah. with how power uh, works there versus here. Uh, you know, if you want to uh, talk about speakers of the house, uh, we can certainly do that. Uh, but Larry, Brad alluded to this. We should probably start off and get out of the way first with this incredibly, you know, kind of circuitous journey that led to the publication of this book, Mr. Texas. And, you know, without giving anything away, I found the story of how this book came to be particularly interesting because it is the most in the moment novel. Uh, it is very, very rare that you're able to create, you know, real literature off of the stuff of present day headlines. But in fact, this is a super up to date book. And it, it, it even includes the current governor and lieutenant governor of Texas, uh, Greg Abbott and, um, and Dan Patrick, uh, his, even in, here up in here in Washington, those are famous names. Uh, <laughs> maybe not always much praised famous <laughs> names. Uh, but seriously, how is that even possible given how long the, the gestation period for this book has been? Well, thank you, Susan, and, and thank you all for coming, and Brad, and the politics and prose. My, my son used to be a barista at the original politics and prose, so it goes deep in the family. Um, and Susan, I'm so honored to have you here with me. This is, it means so much. Uh, and you and Peter are, are a kind of historical example. Of, I mean, I was trying to, Brad and I were talking about it. I can only think of uh, Will and Ariel Durant as, you know, they, they were historians, but uh, in terms of your partnership, it's, it's really fascinating. And productive. Well, it's super kind of you. See, he's filibustering. This is a technique that he's gotten <laughs> from uh, all of those politicians he's observed. All right, so all right. right well, <laughs> I, I will tell the story of how this came about. Um, this actually began back in the Ann Richards administration when Texas was blue. And my hero was blue back in those days. But uh, I wanted, at the time, I thought I'm, I was sick of journalism. I wanted to be a movie director. And I had written several scripts, um, one made into a movie and then eventually another one, but most of the scripts never got made. And I thought, if only I would be a director, it would be made like that. <laughs> so uh, I wrote a movie script um, about a young man who is a rancher from Marfa and uh, gets elected to the Texas House of Representatives, which is my favorite political body. And... Uh, you know, uh, for some reason that never got made as a movie, and uh, I had a table reading, and uh, the director said, why don't you do it as a play? And his next sentence was, we've already rented the theater. <laughs> well, okay, uh, when are we putting on this play? Four months. So I wrote the play, and we cast it and rehearsed it and staged it in four months. And uh, we had two productions in Austin, uh, a well-known Broadway producer named Margot Lyon, some of you may know of her. She did Angels in America and, and Hairspray and so many great musicals. She came down and said, it should be a musical. And so, oh, hadn't occurred to me, but now that you mention it, it's a musical. So I partnered with my pal, Marsha Ball, who's a great R&B piano player, singer, songwriter. And we started writing music and then Margot changed her mind and said, it should be a television series. <laughs> All right, okay. I sold a script to a pilot to HBO. And uh, I thought, well, okay, here we go. And then they fired my executive and dumped all of his projects. <laughs> so I had no musical, I had no HBO series, and so here comes the pandemic, and I called my agent. I said, this is the dearest project to me. What can I do with it? Podcast! <laughs> <laughs> Really? Okay. So I wrote eight episodes of a podcast, and Marsha and I and my son, Gordon, we wrote 53 songs. We had the best time. I'm telling you, if you want to have a good time, songwriting is it. And so, but we hadn't taken into account, nor had my agent, that uh, podcasts are meant to be cheap, kind of like what we're doing, you and I with a microphone. You know, we're all podcasters now, right? You know I, I know. And, but when you have a cast of 15 and you need a full band, 
uh, it's a little more expensive than a podcast allows. And it was like we built a ship in the basement and now we can't get it up the steps. I don't know what we were thinking. <laughs> so after all that, this thunderbolt came into my mind. You're a book writer. <laughs> Why don't you just write a novel? And uh, I know it sounds, it, it, it sounds like a lot of wasted time to come up with, but the truth is, by the time I turned around to write it as a novel, I was so intimately involved with the characters. I, and I had written them in different ways. I have them on the screen. You know, I have them doing things that I wouldn't have imagined if I didn't have the need for action uh, that a movie would evoke. Or, you know, the, the, the intimacy that you have on a stage play. Uh, all of those things were uh, a way of teaching me how to write it as a novel. My characters evolved over that period of time uh, because, you know, they went, you know, Texas went from being entirely blue to being entirely red. And so my character had to become a Republican, otherwise he would be marginalized. And, uh, but bits of that, you know, the, the, the research I did from the very beginning uh, helped set the frame that's still useful. I, if you'll forgive me, I'll tell you a little bit about this, my, m the hero that for me, for as a, sometimes you have a source who becomes like your favorite person in the world because he can tell you so much. When I first conceived this idea, the speaker of the house was Pete Laney. He was a cotton farmer from the Panhandle. And uh, Bob Bullock was this notorious uh, lieutenant governor and married five times, you know, occasionally jailed. You know, he, uh, he was, but everybody loved him because he loved Texas so much and that was radiant. And so um, I went to see Pete Laney and I told him that I was thinking about writing a movie or a television series about the Texas House of Representatives. And he said, it's been the dream of my life to have a <laughs> television series set in the Texas House of Representatives. <laughs> I said, well, I can help you with that. And uh, so I, I would ask him, you know, questions about, you know, my, my hero has a, a, is in a war with a lobbyist. Uh, and I need for the lobbyist to do something that would really screw him, short of killing him. And he said, well, you could put a toxic waste dump in his district. That yeah, sure would mess him up. <laughs> oh, God, I mean, you're just writing it for me. <laughs> and so, Pete, you guys hunt, right? You, and, well, I don't myself. Well, what do they hunt? Pigs. They hunt pigs? That sounded so pathetic. And uh, I said, how do you do that? Well, I up. Honey, get Sharp on the line. Sharp, John Sharp was the te Texas comptroller and is now the chancellor of the NM system. And so, Sharp, I got this young man in my office. He wants to know how you hunt pigs. Well, we do it at night in our cutoffs with tennis shoes, and we use pistols, and we set the dogs after them. And then the dogs will go after a pig's nuts, and the pig will protect himself by backing up against a tree. And then you just take your pistol and pop him in the eye. I thought... Wow, these are the Democrats. <laughs> so after that, I, I felt like, you know, I was on a roll. I had these people. Were, the thing about Texas is as much as people hate their government, they cherish the characters. And, and the people inside the institution of the legislature uh, love being a part of it. And they want to talk about it. So that's a real help to a person who's researching it. Well, and I, it, it, it's that line between sort of love and cynicism that uh, I think comes through in in the book in particular. But it's interesting that you sat with the main character and with these themes for so long, both through the political transformation of Texas, but also uh, through to a different moment in the country writ large, right? And so that's one question I have for you. Did, did you already understand in the Ann Richards era that you were looking for some way out of the politics of the extremes because what I really loved about your protagonist who's this you know sort of rancher novice Iraq war veteran um, is that he manages to sort of sum up and symbolize the present dilemma of a politics in which 
both Democrats and Republicans have basically zero incentive to engage with each other. And his sort of assault on the system is simply to talk to the other side in some ways. You know, I, as, as the politics evolved, so did my understanding. And uh, there was a, a critical moment in this period was uh, two sessions ago, uh, our editor, David Remnick, asked me to explain Texas, and because he doesn't understand why I live there. And uh, as none of, the, of my colleagues seem to. So, uh, but one part of that was covering the politics. And it was really ugly. It was a very, very uh, rancorous session. And um, Joe Strauss, who is the Republican speaker, speaker of the House, a singular courageous figure, stopped this uh, anti-gay, anti-trans trend, just stood in front of the train, and as a result, was knocked off his post as speaker and thrown out of the Republican Party. And uh, it was a radicalizing moment for me as a writer. I realized I needed to make this more current. I need to address real problems, uh, you know, abortion, immigration, you know, these kind, you know, guns, all of these things that are so central. And also, I, in the writing of that God Save Texas book and the New Yorker article, I came to realize that no matter what you think about Texas, it's going to be the most important state in the union. It's by 2050, it's it's expected to be the size of California and New York combined. And if you look at the last census where each of those states lost an electoral vote, they both went to Texas. But that movement is just only is increasing, especially since the pandemic. So Texas is already important, but imagine being the dominant state in demography, in population, in in finance, in resources, all of those things make it the immovable future of America. And I worry, in fact, I'm distraught by the idea that Texans aren't prepared for that. We are all, we grew up thinking that we're the outsiders, yeah. that, you know, the elites, you know, on both coasts, you know, they run the show and we're just kind of rebels down here and we do whatever we want to, you know. We don't educate our kids. We haven't built the infrastructure. We, there's so much that we have to do to assume the responsibility uh, of leading the country. But so it's really interesting to see the burden that that puts on an already stressed politics. There were moments reading the book that I thought, oh, well, this is actually, you know, a portrait of Austin is really not Washington, and that actually there are sort of flashes of how politics used to be even up here, right? There's a, uh, you know, famous old Texas speaker, Sam Rayburn, right, and his board of education, where the, the boys would meet after hours, right, and they would, and you have a version of that in a dominoes game yeah. uh, that they're playing even in this modern day setting of this novel, and yet, Right. Like dot, 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 because actually you did bring the novel up to the present moment and you do have the very familiar cycles of outrage and, you know, kind of crazy manufactured uh, storylines and an inability, it seems, to bridge the gap. So I was just wondering, like, how much is that a very recent phenomenon? I mean, you you talk, you take on the current leadership of Texas very directly and essentially hold uh, at least the lieutenant governor very much responsible for that. You portray the, the governor as basically a, a pawn or a hostage, really, of uh, his party's more extreme elements. But, um, you know, was that is that something that you've just seen the last few years, or was that building for a long time? It's gotten worse. You know, it was, it's been building, of course, and these people have been in office for a long time. Um, but, you know, it's gotten to where we... We miss Rick Perry, you know, uh, the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. By the way, I think there are two references to Rick Perry in this book, which might be two more references than have been made uh, in a national conversation <laughs> about uh, <laughs> politics for a while. Probably two more than he merits, but um, <laughs> it's, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, right now we're in Washington, D.C., but I feel like the political action in the country is in the states. You know, the, the forces of change, the ferment is boiling over in the states. And it's not just Texas. You know, te states all over the Union are, you know, having these royal political battles. 
And as in that sense, I realize that the writing about Texas politics has a universality that it might not otherwise have. So, okay, let's, I'm curious, just as a, a you know, switching genres so much and going from being a writer of nonfiction books, including, you know, great uh, piece and book about this transformation of Texas that's occurring and there are echoes of your sort of writing for the New Yorker in the book where you talk about kind of the cranes hovering over Austin and transforming the city that you love, uh, you know, is Austin even worthy of its old nickname of, you know, keeping itself weird? Has yeah. it, you know, lost the weirdness? Mm -hmm. You've written about that in a nonfiction sense. So, you know, speaking as a, a you know, a writer with, a, you know, maybe aspirations not always to be trapped, uh, you know, in the realm of nonfiction, do you feel liberated uh, when you're, when you're writing a book like this? Is it, is it as true in some ways as, as the journalism about politics? Is it hard to, to switch between? Well, I've, you know, I've written fiction and, you know, I've written a lot of plays and, you know, movie scripts and so on. So it, there is, you know, I've always had an aura on the other side of the boat. And, uh, it, but they, they cross-fertilize. Um, you know, it was a revelation to me when I started writing movies that there's no narrative. You know, it's all scenes and characters. And those are very powerful tools for any writer, but a lot, not a, a lot of nonfiction writers don't take advantage of it. And so that was one of the things I thought I can put in my toolkit. Uh, dialogue was another. Uh, I, I feel like if you have a good ear for dialogue, it brings characters alive, and uh, and it it nails them to a place. And that was one of the things I. Uh, you know, little locutions, like I I've, had been saving up for the opportunity to use this particular Texanism, which is used to could have. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it, if, you, if you are a Texan and you spot that, it's like, oh, yeah, I, I see that. I grew up in Dallas during the Kennedy assassination, and um, when I wrote... Uh, one of my first books uh, called In the New World about that subject. Um, there was practically no literature about Dallas. Uh, there was one by a PR agent who had written after the, uh, after the assassination called Dallas Public and Private, but the, the cover was bare. If, if Brad had opened a bookstore in Dallas at that time, there wouldn't be a Dallas section. And, um, and that leaves you a little bit at sea about your identity. You know, I, I, when I started writing about Texas during that time in Dallas, I realized there just wasn't, there weren't any mirrors out there. You know, if I had grown up in Paris or Brooklyn, you know, I, I, there'd be so much, uh, so much, so many views on who we are and where we came from and what we stand for and what our problems are. It was nothing like that. And I think there's a, Right now, there's a I think there are more writers in Austin than any other place outside of Brooklyn, uh, and they're in the process of creating that literature that we lacked. Yeah, but it's definitely still in the process. I think there's a really important point. When we were doing our biography of Jim Baker, uh, the former Secretary of State, I mean, really his family story is entwined with the story of Houston, and it's uh, you know three generations going back, basically. And we struggled with this, uh, especially not being native Houstonians ourselves, right? You know, it's not something, you know, I think they feel, uh, you know, uh, they just sort of know it in their bones. But um, what we found was that there were sort of boosterish corporate histories of, you know, aspects of, of Houston, the story of the railroads, which you tell, of course, more beautifully uh, than than anything we found in the course of our research in this novel. You, you mentioned sort of uh, nod to some of that history. But I, I think you're right about this sort of identity comes along with history. And again, that's what exudes such power here. Now, I want to talk a little bit about our protagonist, actually. And, you know, you call the book Mr. Texas, and there's a, without giving anything away, there's a, uh, a sort of a, a campaign ad template uh, for our character, Sonny uh, Lamb, who goes from being a floundering rancher to a candidate almost overnight and the cynical political consultants make an ad 
uh, in which he's, you know, practically the the Marlboro Man, right? <laughs> Reincarnated, and the ad is called Mr. Texas. But I also noticed that historically, I don't know if people have brought this up, I believe that was Mr. Texas was also uh, the nickname given at one point to, um, to LBJ's famous opponent in that really uh, sort of definitive Senate race uh, in 1948 that made LBJ... LBJ, right? He ran against Coke Stevenson. So what were you trying to tell us with the title, Mr. Texas? Well, people have asked me who is Mr. Texas in it, and it, Sonny Lamb is the, the, like the mannequin on which this uh, hip young director has draped the mythology of the Alamo and the, and the cowboys and all this sort of thing, and used you know, a drone to follow him as his stallion bucks up, and then he rides off into the sunset, and the drone is taking a good shot. That's Mr. Texas. He's a he's an artifact. He's a creation, and uh, and and it stands in for much of Texas culture, which is you know we have this mythology that uh, there there are places in America that have you know Hollywood has a lot of mythology around it, and you know Chicago in certain disreputable ways, but Texas is just it's like. Egypt with the pharaohs or something like that. You know, they, you know this, this massive mythology, you know, particularly the cowboy thing, which, you know, the trail drives lasted for, I think, 16 years. Mm -hmm. And that it could have so much resonance through, I mean, people still dress like cowboys, real estate agents. You know, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's, it's fascinating. And so it's that construction of a of a personality that's not entirely true and not entirely false that uh, is Mr. Texas. And I also thought there was a lot of sort of empathy that although it's rooted in this place of Texas, it's also kind of a story about uh, rural America. It's about left behind America, uh, climate change. It's about, you know, sort of why do people stay in places that don't make any sense for them to stay in yeah. anymore? I mean, I really, I was reading that part of it where this, you know, Sonny Lamb is literally watching his land dry up and his uh, ability to raise cattle disappearing, water going away, neighbors 20 miles away, completely out of it, hopeless, they're, you know, drugs, the whole thing. And it very resonant of say, post-industrial parts of America. I, parts of it reminded me of some of my reporting years ago in, in Russia, uh, in, in the far out, outer reaches of empire where people were living in places and you thought, why don't you just leave? Right. <laughs> Maybe Texas was the idea that's keeping some of them in this place. Uh, the figure of um, uh, your character's wife is, is kind of an example oh, of that. Yeah. yeah, that she, you know, why is she staying there? You know, uh, in one of the big inspirations for the for the novel and for the all of the whole history of this tra long tale, there was a there was a Texas Monthly uh, issue devoted to cowgirls, and on the cover, I think it was on the cover, there was this portrait of this one woman, who was not pretty but attractive, strong. You know, she had a little scar. Uh, you know, she was appealing and formidable at the same time. And I thought nobody's written about her. You know, she is a real Texas woman. She's a modern cowgirl. She's a rancher struggling with all these problems. And um, I thought, you know, they filed it away. And in my mind, that's Lola. And uh, she's come to life in my book because she planted a seed in my mind that I could never get rid of and in a way you know she became the excuse to invent Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> although you did say that the state house of representatives is your favorite political body and yeah. clearly you had that in mind as well for a long time you wanted this to be a politics novel and it is deeply informed about you know what it takes to get a bill out of committee in the texas house which is basically only the imprimatur of the, the speaker more or less um why is the State House of Representatives your favorite political body? Well, every other year, the Texas legislature doesn't meet every year. It meets every other year because, you know, you know, the less government, the better is the philosophy. And frankly, when you see them, <laughs> you think, yeah, <laughs> time for you to go home now. Uh, the, uh, 
it's 150 members, and they represent 30 million Texans. And and they're in there. There are people of every race, people from every little county in well, not every county, because there are 254 counties in Texas, and uh, they they come from all over the state. Some of them are former NFL football players, or billionaires, or they're nurses and doctors, and you know, the, and it's a concentrate of Texas. You know, if you boiled it all down to 150 people, they would be the House of Representatives. And I like the you know the Mr. Smith goes to Washington feeling for. Every year, every other year, you have these people who have thrown themselves out to their public and said, you know, vote for me. And that's a, that's a bold thing to do. Uh, and actually, I came close to doing it myself at one point. Wow. And so I came up to the point, I realized the sacrifice that would, you would have to make. So they're, they're driven, they're bold. Some of them are crooks. Some of them have, you know, mental problems, uh, but basically they are as good a representation of Texas as you can get. The Senate, on the other hand, is enslaved to Dan Patrick, and so they're not interesting in any respect. It's really interesting that you mentioned Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, because I have to say there were points along the way where I thought, oh, I'm a little surprised here that this novel, which is born in kind of this cynical act of creation of a political figure who you know really shouldn't be one and doesn't exist that the cynicism at moments is washed away by this you know sort of a uh you know mr sunny lamb goes to austin kind of feel to it and you know what is what is the balance between writing a, a knowing novel about politics and not kind of giving in to cynicism uh you know is it uh do we need just a little bit of wish fulfillment in this uh in this age of trump or you know um how much do you do you think the happy ending is is possible here well as you know it doesn't end happily exactly uh so it's it's uh but i'm not going to say more about the ending um uh, the uh with all my research over the years and many, many discussions that I've had with lawmakers, there's some that I adore, and they're there for good reasons. And, um, you know, for instance, Sonny has a bill. It's his his goal is, you know, West Texas is drying up. You know, just, this is not fiction. And by the way, I love there are lots of important distinctions in the book between West Texas and East Texas. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and it sits on top of an aquifer, uh, but it's salty. And so Sonny's idea is a desalination plant. You know, this would salvage the West Texas way of life. And uh, but the frackers want all that water. So there's a an inherent political imbalance. And uh, you know that Lyle Larson, this guy from San Antonio, who spent I think four or five terms, he passed a bill kind of like that, and he was really helpful to me. Uh, you know, some of the, he, you run into these absolute geeks, you know, about, you know, I, they, they're, they're heroic in their own way, struggling to get something done that is worthy. And, you know, Governor tried to have him primaried and stuff, he's on the same party, but, uh, you know, Lyle kept forging along and got it passed. And people like that, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, uh, ally myself with. I had one guy come in and ask me if he would, if I would meet. His his name was Glenn Rogers, and he's a representative from Palo Pinto County, which is in North Texas. Uh, and uh, he wanted to let me know. He wanted me to expose the shenanigans going on in the Texas House. Of course, I'd already written the book, hadn't published it, but. He walked in his tall, lanky rancher, you know, you know, full of ideals. And I thought, he's Sonny Lamb. I was just because he walked into Starbucks. I was just, I just felt thrilled. You know, I, I couldn't take my eyes off of him. I was... Well, I love that you've been able to preserve a little bit of that, you know, that admiration uh, for these folks as well. And actually, there are a lot of 
almost ripped from the headlines examples of things that really did happen in the sort of truth is sometimes stranger than fiction category. I'm not a real student of Texas politics, but I that quorum call is yeah. familiar to me. Uh, yeah. I believe something like that amazingly actually happened when a large number of uh, Texas representatives actually hid for days, right, right, rather than be found. It's gotten to be a habit with them. <laughs> well, I liked I liked that account. Were there other uh, things that you just? I mean, I'm sure reading the papers, you're like, wait, I, can I put that in my novel? Can I put that in my novel? Well, the you know, I wrote about the quorum break in one of these iterations before it ever happened, <laughs> and uh, because you found out, you know, that, that it could happen, and then you think if it could happen, it will happen, and then it did happen. So you know, it's uh, I. I think putting things in, uh, if you have an ear for character and conflict, and, and you're as a journalist or you know even a prospective novelist talking to lawyer, uh, you know members in the in the legislature, they'll gladly tell you the most outrageous things and uh, things that you would never have thought of, and you know some things are so implausible that I didn't put them in the book because like there were there was a guy named Mike Martin uh years ago who was a representative from Longview and he was in a struggle to get reelected so he had his cousin shoot him <laughs> in order in order to get the sympathy vote and uh, he said it was the, the, he had been shot by the mafia which is not a big problem in Texas <laughs> and so and the Texas Rangers caught on to him and they tracked him down to his mother's house in Longview where he was hiding in the stereo closet. And Molly Ivins said, he always did want to be the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well there is one bone to pick which is to say there's not, there's one journalist character but she's actually not a very big figure in the book. I'm wondering uh, whether that was different over time. She is the uh, two times ex-wife of the five times married speaker, is that right? right. Well, she's loosely based on Molly. Uh, Molly was a friend, and uh, you know, uh, I actually, you know, Molly went. She was educated at the Sorbonne, and you know, with all this talk like this and all these good guys and stuff like that, she was really well educated, and uh, her, the daughter of an oil man, and so on. Uh, but she created a space in Texas, along with Ann Richards, that created a kind of stereotype of Texas women. And, you know, so far that stereotype doesn't seem to have, you know, much resonance any longer. I, I guess Texas women have moved on from being uh, folksy. But, um, but they were so powerful. And, I, and, and they provided so much hope. Um, yeah, no, I, I like that. You know, this is the journalist who she manages to get the only invite that's for not a member of the House uh, to go to the, the member's party that the speaker throws at the beginning. Not all to clear that she needed to be in. Right, but, exactly. Yeah. Well, invite might not be the right word. It was reminds me of the, the, the first time I ever saw the legendary Mary McGorry in action, who was the famous Washington Post columnist, and I was a young... Uh, I'm not sure if I was an intern just out of college and I was sent up to Capitol Hill to cover a hearing and, you know, they, it was going to be oversubscribed. So they had the chairs labeled, you know, with the news organizations, the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Chicago Tribune, LA Times. And then there was a chair that said Mary McGorry, <laughs> you know, and I, you know, that was clearly what you had in mind, but yeah, there doesn't seem to be uh, a modern day successor to that, right? Like it's the media is is actually off stage in this book rather than you know it's implied that they're all playing in some way or another to the cameras. Well, Susan, uh, another reason for that is that the politicians won't talk to the media. You know, the governor, the lieutenant governor, they only talk to Fox, and uh, you know they they just simply uh, they want to eliminate the media as much as they can, so they don't the. The press doesn't play a, a, as big a role in Texas politics as it should. Although I have to say, there's, again, without giving anything away, the, the local radio <laughs> show hosts who are named Pat and Pat, yeah. uh, husband-wife team, yeah. uh, <laughs> they, they show you a little bit about uh, the nature of uh, local coverage. I, guess. I had a lot of fun working on that scene. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, it shows. It definitely shows. Um, how, how do you tell us how you would make some distinctions between the politics in Austin today and what we're seeing up here in Washington? What, um, let's talk about our, our, let's say, uh, benighted speaker, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, he's facing a time of troubles right now. What would, uh, the great Texas speakers of the past, what would they advise him to do to get out of this mess with Matt Gates? Well, he should never have tied himself to the mass the way that he did. Uh, you know, also, you know, you mentioned Sam Rayburn. He, he had the art of compromise. You know, when he first ran for uh, Texas House, and Robert Caro has this scene in, in uh, I think, the first of his volumes, but uh, he and his opponent uh, got to be friends, and they would ride a wagon around, you know, their district uh, from place to place. And Rayburn won, but they were lifelong friends. And uh, it, it spoke a lot about L to LBJ that he became Rayburn's protege. And also he used Rayburn sometimes, but uh, that, that spirit of you know, working together. I think the best time that I've experienced in Texas politics was when Bush was governor and both of the houses were Democrat. It was, it was an, and, and, and Pete Laney and Bob Bullock endorsed Bush for president. I mean, it really spoke to the bipartisanship and the, the absence of rancor uh, that is so characteristic of our politics now. Yeah, no, and then, of course, you could argue that that was one of the things that sort of hit Bush like a ton of bricks here in Washington, right? The idea yeah. of uh, a compassionate conservatism didn't really survive the transition from from Austin to, to Washington. and. Uh, you know, you, you've made a, a study and are friends over the years with Karl Rove, who makes a couple of cameo appearances. But somebody like that plays a kind of a different role in, in Texas politics, I wonder, than they do at the national stage. You know, I think back to that 2004 campaign that Bush won for re-election in which they, you know, basically did what they had to do, right? They had yeah. to win Ohio. So if that meant that they were going to run a, an anti-gay campaign in that state that they were going to do that even though it wasn't something that Bush believed in. Yeah, you mentioned Carl. I, I think he wonders what he wrought now because he's a homeless, uh, like a lot of uh, Republicans. Um, and this, this adventure we just had in the Texas legislature with our Attorney General Ken Paxton, it shows you where the party is right now because in the House, an overwhelming majority, including of Republicans, voted to impeach and and then uh, he's acquitted in the the senate why would that be did it, would it have anything to do with the three million dollars that a midland oil man put on uh, patrick's desk uh a million down with two million to come as a loan uh I, you know texas has never really been corrupt you know with all of its other failings we only impeached one other statewide official in our whole history this governor named James Pa Ferguson in 1917. and That's the, how you got Ma Ferguson? Yeah, the voters were so upset that they voted it in his wife. Um, so, but it's not like Illinois or New Jersey or New York, you know, where you have, you know, chronic cases of, you know, corruption. But in Texas, it's sort of, this recently, I think it's more just, it's corrupt, but it's not being hidden. They don't have the good taste of doing it under the table. Well, money is a sort of uh, uh, absolutely a, a factor in all of the, the plot developments here in this book. And I, I say this as a, a native of New Jersey, and I should point out that with the recent indictment of Senator Menendez, it was... Uh, people went back to a Washington Post article of a few years ago that attempted to calculate and they came up with the idea that actually New Jersey per capita had the most corrupt uh, officials in the country. So, you know, pro props to Texas there. Yeah. Uh, but but money is a factor in this book yeah. and there's a lobbyist who's at the center of it and there is a very nefarious force uh uh, who is not only this sort of wealthy oil man, but also he's like a weird fusion of Harlan Crow and Rush Limbaugh, uh, uh, which I found another, interesting. There's another person that you may not know of, but it's um, Dr. Stephen Hotze. And uh, he's uh, a, a doctor in, in, um, in Houston. He was also one of Dan Patrick's business partners. He has a show on Dan Patrick's radio station. And uh, he... What, well, he made his fortune from prescribing 
these alternative medicines, one of which is this sort of collodial silver that will turn you as blue as your shirt there, uh, and permanently. And, uh, and you also good for pets and stuff like that. So, you know, he, he sells all this stuff. He makes a lot of money. And he's, he's a one-man anti-gay bandwagon. He's, I mean, it's just rabid. And, and not only does he have the ear of the lieutenant governor, he's, you know, he, he funds him. Does he also have a collection of Nazi memorabilia, or was that Harlan Crow? That, <laughs> well, <laughs> I've never met Harlan, uh, but I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, he has a, uh, he calls it the Garden of Evil. Uh, whenever a dictator falls, he has an agent go around and buy the statues that they've pulled down. So he's got Saddam Hussein, and, you know, uh, I don't know if he has Hitler, but he has, uh, you know, uh, uh, even Kalchescu and people, the kind of obscure guys, um, Mao. Uh, and uh, so th there was, he, but the, the radio thing plays out because Dan Patrick was a, a shock jock and he got rich when he bought the station and had the foresight to uh, get an unknown broadcaster named Rush Limbaugh on his station. And so he made quite a lot of money in that. And that's the media that does uh, get written about in the book. So. You know, the thing is that you know, when technology changes, you know, the, you have these surprises. Like Pappy Leo Daniel was a, a wild character and a terrible political figure, but he he uh, he sold flour and he uh, he he was known as Pass the Biscuits Pappy, and but he came on at the noon hour on radio when women were cooking, you know, their, their meals. And uh, we were used to, in Texas, this was in the 20s, 40s maybe, uh, maybe 100 people would come to an event. You know, suddenly Pappy came into town. Thousands of people. And it was a phenomenal, who is this guy? You know, the men didn't know him. And uh, in a way, Dan Patrick was a little like that because he had been doing this shock jock stuff in Houston, and he had his patter down, and he had his, his ditto heads. And so when he got elected, it was an overwhelming election. And so he exercised a kind of power because other people hadn't seen it coming. Well, I've been monopolizing our guests, so I want to make sure that we have time for some questions. Uh, if you guys, yeah, we have a microphone here. If you can just uh, tell us who you are and make it a question so we can get to it's, a few. It's, it's Jim Zogby. Um, Larry, you talked in the beginning about the evolution of the character from blue to red as Texas changed. I get the difference in the issues, but were there cultural cons constants that defined the character that stayed throughout? And does that make, is there a comment in that about Texas shifting from blue to red, but some things not shifting? You know, it was interesting when, when Sonny became a Republican, I didn't always agree with him. You know, it was it was interesting. I had to make him his stances consonant with his character and his party, and 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 had to be sympathetic with it. Um, and so it was created an interesting dynamism. You know, I had him early on. You know, he he he's a rancher in West Texas. He had guns. You know, there's but now it's an issue about guns, and he's beginning to realize that you know the guns are a problem in the state and the uh, immigration you know immigration wasn't such a an issue when i started this and now his ranch is down near the border and people come across his ranch all the time it's sometimes threatening you know so there's there's a nuance about how if you really live there you know and people were crossing your land and some of your neighbors were being robbed and stuff like that it, it becomes a bigger issue. So it, it caused me to focus on how would I feel if I were in his place? What were the constants? Well, he was always going to get elected. Uh, and that was one thing. I, uh, and, and he was always going to be compassionate in however, you know, whatever legislation came up. And my, if there's an author's message in this book, you know, it's that Texas needs to move away from this kind of cultural war 
into a politics of pragmatism and compassion. These are the elements that are totally lacking in that. And I would say that was true from the beginning. Hi, uh, Steve Collinson. Um, if you had written this book 10, 15 years in the future, do you think you would have had to make him a Democrat again? <laughs> or, or is that some, you know, uh, it's like the pipe dream that's always 4% away from happening. And what happens to those people that come to these big new suburbs, the big cities from California and elsewhere? Do they, do they make Texas more like the place they've come from, or do they become more Texan, and is that the key to its kind of politics going forward? Well, it's interesting because the demography is going to determine the answer to your question. And if you look at the big trends, um, Texas is the most urban state in the country. Uh, four of the 10 largest cities are in Texas. Austin just became number 10. Um, and Texas is a majority minority state already. Um, and so, and most people go into the cities. So in those demographic, and, and also young people have a lot of issue with the issues with the Republicans on abortion and climate change and so on. So if you look at that, you say, well, it's going to flip any time. We've been saying that for some time, but I think it is inevitable that there will be a shift and some, some, we haven't had uh, the kinds of charismatic candidates that could effectively make those kinds of changes. Now, I'll, I'll talk about Beto if you, that was what you are going to do. Yeah, yeah. But um, Beto was a singular, he's a, he's a noble campaigner, and he raised a lot of money, so much so the Democratic Party asked him for money. And uh, he was weakened because we didn't have a real slate uh, you know, he he was the top of the ticket, but uh, the rest of the ticket was indifferent. Had either one of the Castro boys announced for a statewide office, uh, somebody would have gotten elected. Could be, all three of them would have. But um, they've never done that, nor has any charismatic, in, uh, interesting Hispanic done so. There was one lawyer from from Houston that, you know, was the opposite of charismatic, whatever that is. And, uh, and and seemed uninterested and was not going to ever capture the South Texas vote. So those are, you know, real obstacles. The, the new people, I thought, you know, with all these Californians, one out of three moving to, Cal to Texas is a Californian. So there's an evacuation going on. And uh, I thought, well, this is going to turn Texas blue. But it, most of them are tax refugees. And uh, they... They are, you know, the people with money are weird libertarians. Uh, they, they, they have an awful lot of money to affect their dreams. Uh, you know, Elon Musk is just, you know, the head of the tribe. But uh, it's, and it's, it's unclear where they're going to go. Um, but they are, and some of them are one, I don't want to, some of them are terrific people, and I'm so happy they came. Uh, but then there are others that I look at with a little bit of concern uh, because, you know, Austin never really had billionaires. I mean, Michael Dell was like the first. And, uh, but suddenly, you know, there, there are a nest of billionaires in my own neighborhood. And I said, fine, it's killing the property tax. But. <laughs> well, uh, I think we have time for, no, we have time for a few more, yeah. Hi, I'm Amy Schaefer. I was wondering, now that you have written the book, ha has any of uh, Hollywood come forward to do a, a movie? Yeah, now we can recycle it into a movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I am talking to, uh, uh, and you know, about a series, and I, you know, I would like for that to happen. Uh, I've had the experience of working in Hollywood, and one of the things I've learned is you, you don't buy the house until you eat the popcorn. <laughs> and so uh, the, uh, there's another thing I'd like to do with all the songs. You know, I really want to uh, see it as a musical, and I'd like for the series to be a musical, but television has never really been hospitable to, 
to musicals in that sense. But uh, the audio version of Mr. Texas has some of the music on it. We recorded eight songs uh, that are at the end of the audio book, and the, and the instrumental stuff plays uh, incrementally through the book. Oh, hi, um, George Faison. Um, kind of along the same lines, you, your list of accomplishments is so incredible and amazing. I was wondering if there's something that you have never done, you've never even tried, that you're really looking to do before, you know, before you retire in the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I, not in the sense that you're expecting. I mean, I did come close to running for governor, but uh, my wife, uh, I couldn't carry my house. So uh, <laughs> it was a bad sign. Um, and I'm grateful that I didn't because uh, I really cherish what I'm doing. And uh, I am I took a vow years ago to only do things that were important or fun. And I wanted to be a part of important things, but I didn't want to give up on the joy. And uh, and this has you know, been a very joyful experience for me. Uh, and I want to, I'm probably more productive now than I have been ever in my life because I just am in a hurry to squeeze it all out of the tube. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like I've got more to say and I just want to say it. This lady. Just one last question. I'm Christina and uh, Austin obviously loves being weird. Does, do you think Texas sees itself as outlandish? Do they identify with characters like this, with those with those uh, scenes in, in the legislature that are so hilarious? or Oh, listen, you know, real scenes have taken place in the Texas legislature that, you know, my scenes scarcely, I mean, there are so many weird moments in the history of the legislature that, um, and, and everybody in the legislature loves to tell those stories. Uh, you know, like the, when they had the national, you know, the statewide uh, handicaps you know, and they had all these people in wheelchairs come in to be acknowledged, and the speaker says, will all those folks being recognized please stand? <laughs> you, know, so it's like, you can't, you know, please. Uh, there, there are just so many instances like that that uh, they don't necessarily get into the book, but the idea of them gets into the book. And, you know, I think... You know, the, the book is doing very well in Texas. The question is going to be whether, you know, the rest of the country is tolerant enough of Texas to want to buy the book. Um, I'm, you know, I'm hoping this crowd will go out and spread the word that it's, <laughs> that it's not changing America for the worse. Well, that's a good note to end it on. I can certainly personally vouch for uh, the worthiness of the book and its applicability in Washington, I, I would say, is, is undisputable, except maybe our Washington members of Congress aren't quite such good raconteurs. Uh, <laughs> Larry, this has been a fantastic conversation. And seriously, if you haven't already bought the book, buy the book. It sounds like you should get the audio book, too. Uh, and, you know, no reason you can't have both, uh, right? We encourage Actually, both. Actually, Brad, in there, an, uh, you can order an audio book that gives you, uh, gives a local bookseller a cut of it. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, I've okay. got Thank you uh, both. It's been really fascinating. Uh, copies of the book are available at the checkout desk, and Larry will gladly sign them. He'll be up here. Um, so let's give uh, both uh, Larry and Susan a round of applause.